Not only my sermon this morning is who are we really? Who are we really? Before we get into the passage, you can start going there. And if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Mark chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, there's a bunch on that back shelf, and you may take one. And if you need one, just take it home. We have plenty. So, uh, whatever it is, if you'd like a Bible, please get one. I'm going to be in Mark chapter 7, but I want to talk about something that I don't normally do. I'm going to talk about a book that I've read recently. This book was named Unchristian. Unchristian was written by a guy named David Kinneman. Who is a Christian guy? And his normal job is he runs a research company. So uh, let's say you want to be able to sell a specific thing and you've got to figure out the people what they like and don't like. His job is to do research and to make surveys and to figure out accurately uh, what the people are like so that you can figure out how to market your stuff. This is his job. And, uh, but he was asked and he took on a project as a Christian to find out the answer to this question. What do people outside of the church think of the people inside the church? He, he set out to answer this question. What do the people outside the church think of the people inside the church? Which is actually a very interesting question. Now, I'm going to use a demographic. This, all of this information came from America. So it is not going to be perfect for Australia, and I understand that. So as you're listening to this, you got to imagine America. But I think that the American church isn't too far off, at least from where the Australian church is going. In general, I think there's at least some similarities. So here's, here's some answers. Now these answers are from ages 16 to 29. So this is younger people. If you're a teenager or a younger person in the room, you might identify with some of these attitudes secretly, or maybe not so secretly, maybe you openly agree. So, so you might listen to this, because you might identify, if you're a younger person in the room, with some of these things. This is attitudes of pe people between the ages of 16 and 29 that are outside the church about people inside the church. And here's the question. What do you think of first when you think of the church? That was the question. Number one answer. 91% anti-homosexual. That's who the church is. Well, what does the church stand for? Or what are they trying to do? Or what are they about? Oh, they hate gay people. That's, that's the number one answer. Answer is uh, ages 16 to 29, 91%. Uh, answer number two, at 87% is judgmental. Answer number three, hypocritical at 85%. Answer number four, old-fashioned at 78%, too political at 75%, out of touch at 72 insensitive at 70 That's an interesting vision of the church, isn't it? Interesting vision of how people outside the church look in and what do they see? What do they think we're about? What do they think our message is? That's what they're coming up with. Now here's some irony for you. That same age group doesn't see Jesus that way. If you ask that same age group about how do you think of Jesus as a historical figure, or whatever the case may be, they don't come up with these answers. They don't see Jesus as anti-homosexual, or hypocritical, or too political, or insensitive, or judgmental, or fashion, or out of touch. They don't see him as that way at all. See, somehow, there's a difference between how, even outside the church, people see Jesus and how people see the church. They're not the same. So, here's the question. Are they right, or are they wrong? Is the church disconnected from Jesus' message? Well, here's some other inf interesting information that might blow your mind. Uh, I had a conversation earlier in the week with Pete about the population of America. I just, I'm not going to say how badly wrong I was. I was really wrong about the population of America. Okay, the, um, so the population of America is about 327 million. Here's how many people out of 327 million 
have made a commitment to Jesus that they think is important to them in some way. Ready for this number? Because it's not Australian. 70%. 70% of those 327 million people would say they have at some point in their life made a commitment to Jesus Christ, and that commitment is still important to them in some way. Now, I'm not saying they still go to church. They may not have walked into a church the last five years. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, yeah, I went to camp once, or I remember there was a guy that came to the door, or I had a friend, and I said a prayer, or I walked an aisle. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't do much with it now, necessarily, but, but I made a commitment once, and that commitment still is important to me in some way. At least that level, 70% of the people. But if we change the question to absolutely committed, if we said, how many people in America, what percentage, are absolutely committed to Jesus Christ as their Savior? This means that they would go to church regularly, maybe not every week, but they're there all frequently. Now the numbers are almost cut in half, 38%. So the amount of people who would say, yeah, I made a, a decision once, I said something, I prayed a prayer, and the amount that actually go to church regularly is, is, is huge, it's half. They actually do something regularly, and the ones that say, I've made a commitment once, I said something once. Yeah, that's still kind of important to me. I still consider myself a Christian. But here's where it really gets bizarre. You see, if you change the question to, is the Bible your primary source for truth relevant to your daily life and the foundation of how you view the world, guess what the number drops to? Six percent. <laughs> Well, that's like ears dripping out, you know, blood. Six percent. Six percent. That means we have a vast amount of people, a huge amount of people, claiming to be Christians, saying, yep, I would raise my hand, I'm in the Christian camp, who are religious, but not biblical. They're religious, but they're not biblical. I think there's a correlation here. See, Jesus had a biblical worldview. That's right. In fact, Jesus is the biblical worldview. Like whatever view Jesus hid, had, that, whatever, that actually defines the biblical worldview. He is the very definition of the biblical worldview. He is it. Whatever opinion Jesus has, that's what we go to the Bible constantly to try to figure out. That's the very thing we are trying to, to grab, is what did Jesus think? That's what biblical worldview means. You see, Jesus, from whom we're supposed to be gaining this biblical worldview, apparently had a view of the Bible and of the Word of God only held by 6% of the Christian of the people in America, while 70% might wear the label. Jesus wasn't viewed as anti-homosexual. Jesus was viewed as a friend of sinners. Jesus wasn't viewed as judgmental. He was viewed as a forgiver. He wasn't viewed as hypocritical. He was viewed as 100% genuine. He wasn't viewed as old-fashioned. He was viewed as eternally relevant. He wasn't viewed as overly political. He was viewed as pretty much politically disinterested. He wasn't viewed as out of touch. He touched the sick. He wasn't viewed as insensitive. He was considered a person with supernatural insight. Maybe if the church can do better than 6%, we can fix our image problem. Because maybe our image problem comes not from the fact that we're Christians and we have this label. It's because we're not actually biblical. Last, well, that's actually what this passage is going to be about. Last week I promised that we would look at a scene where Jesus absolutely destroys some mega, mega, mega religious guys who have come to mess with him. So here's the scene. And this is all going to come together, I promise. In Mark 7, 1 through 5, these Pharisees, that's the mega religious people, they've come in and Jesus is healing people and these mega religious guys come in. And here's their complaint. Jesus, your disciples are not doing the ceremonial hand washing before they eat. Shame, shame. 
This was not just regular washing of hands to keep from getting the coronavirus, okay? This was a special religious ceremonial thing. And he was, they were complaining that his disciples were doing that. And Jesus has a wonderful response to this question, starting in verse um, 14 and going through verse 23. And that's what I preached on last week. And if you'd like to hear it, it's on YouTube. But what I promised was that this week we would talk about something else. Because before he answers the question, he gives this blistering counterattack to the people who attacked him. And that's what we're talking about this week. Blistering counterattack. So we're going to read that blistering counterattack. Mark chapter 7, verse 6 through 13. Mark chapter 7, verse 6 through 13. This is what Jesus said. Rightly did Isaiah the prophet prophesy of, your, of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. What does that mean? Doctrines, precepts of men, these are some churchy words. You just lost me, Pastor, because I don't know these words. Okay. What he's saying is this. This is the accusation. He's saying, you're religious, you're not biblical, and this is your fundamental problem. You have tradition, but you're not actually following what my father told you to do. You got instructions, you're not following them. You have traditions, you're following those, but you're not following the basis of instructions. You have abandoned the truth. That's the example. In your pursuit of being religious, in your pursuit of being more religious, more fancy, more whatever it is, more, more devout, even in that pursuit, you have abandoned what my father really wanted you to act like. That's the, yeah, that's the accusation. And that's what he's saying Isaiah prophesied about them. So in verse 8, he said, Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the traditions of men. So there's the... There's the paraphrase. He was also saying to them, you nicely set aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. That seems pretty serious. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, anything of mine that you might have had has been given as korban, which is that means given to God, you are no longer, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. Thus invalidating the word of God. That's a really important statement. They are invalidating the word of God by what? Their tradition, which they've handed down, and you do many things such as this. This is an example. He's not really talking about the mother-father thing. That isn't, that's, that's the example he's using, but that's not the, the topic. The topic is, is your tradition getting in the way of actually doing what God wants you to do. And that's the end of the passage. So, here's the, so the law, the standard is, honor your mother and father. Let's do a little imagining here. Remember we talked about our impression of people outside the church, of inside the church. And maybe you're in this room and you said, you know what, that resonates with me. Maybe you're in this room and you're 16 or 19 or something and you said, hey, I actually kind of feel that way. Okay, we're trying to deal with that this morning. Imagine someone outside the church looking at the church and thinking bad about us as Christians because we took good care of our parents. Can you imagine that happening? Yeah, me neither. So that's the sort of thing that would give us a bad reputation as a church. If we um, took care of our parents in their old age and made sure we planned for their needs, or we watched about how we spoke about them, we always tried to be careful that we were respectful. No matter what they had done to us, we just had a habit of always being respectful about what we said to our parents because that was our personal standard. Can you imagine the world around us getting upset and thinking we were hypocrites because we did that? No. Absolutely not. It would never happen. This is an example of a biblical worldview. Honor your parents, period. That's it. Not till you're 18, not till you're 21, 
honor your parents forever. That's a biblical worldview. It's one of the biblical worldview that only 6% of Americans really have a grasp of. Apparently. They get it that you have to obey your parents while you're in the house, but as soon as you leave the home, you can treat them any way you want. Now tell me how people might react if you said, oh, yeah, my parents are in a huge mess and, and uh, they're really struggling right now. They really, they can't pay the rent and, but I, I can't help them, see, because I gave all my money to the church. Yeah, I, I gave my money to the church, there's nothing left over to help my folks. How do you think that reads to the same public? Um, let's, what would that ping? That ping's insensitive, right? Or hypocritical or out of touch, right? Some of those main attitudes that we just looked at, that the outside of the church looks in and sees, Okay, that kind of reaction, I can't help my folks because I gave all my money to the church, is going to light up several of those attitudes. That's our problem. This is our problem. And, and here's what's scary this happens. This happens in churches where, where the pressure and the message from the top to give, 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 give more, give more, give your what's in your savings, give over here, and they don't have anything left to take care of their family, and they don't have left to take care of their folks. And, and this is real. This isn't a joke. I wish it was. I had a friend in Guam, and, and he would tell this story, you know, me being me, because I'm I do these things. And I would talk to him about God and about the church and these things. And he said, look, I'm not interested in church, ever. I said, okay, why? He said, well, you know, I have a grandma and she was devout. She went to church every week. She would get a little statement from the church in the mail each month telling her what her tithe was supposed to be. And she paid that. But because she paid it, she didn't have enough money for her heat bill. And because she was freezing, she got sick and she died. The church killed my grandmother. How many hundreds of people do you think he's told that story to? See, the message from that story is that the church doesn't actually love you, they just love your money. It's no wonder Jesus had a good reputation with people outside the church. He's furious with this kind of thing, right? It's no wonder that Jesus has a good reputation amongst the world because the world sees Jesus maybe better than we do. Because at a bare minimum, at a bare minimum, you can go to an atheist and this is what they'll probably say, Jesus was a good guy who I can't live up to. He lived better than me. And yet in the church, we often reduce Jesus into a spokesperson for our religious trope or goal. We make a goal and we make Jesus into our spokesperson, which is a totally different thing to looking up to a role model that I can never measure up to. See, Jesus is absolutely against this kind of hypocrisy. A biblical worldview would never condone using contributions to the church as an excuse for not taking care of your family. That's not a biblical worldview. That's a religious worldview. It's not biblical. That's right. For a while we had those WWJD bracelet things going on. Not a horrible idea. It wasn't terrible. But here's the thing. Did we really mean what Jesus would actually have done, or did we mean what our brand of religion said he would have done? And how much thought did we put into teaching people to understand really what Jesus acted like, did, valued, and how he acted? And so by verse 12, Jesus has diagnosed their problem. They care more for the money than they, they can milk out of people than for the elderly left behind without financial support. And these are the mega religious, super hyper up there. Everyone looks up to them. These are the these are the folks. 
These are, these are the top dogs. The Pharisees are, are what everyone looks up to as the religious elite, the ideal. And this is what they act like. And like I said before, these are the exact kinds of situations that cause a community to hate a church. To hate the church. <clears throat> Verse 13, Jesus breaks it down. Verse 13, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, you do many such things as that. He says you're not actually interested in being biblical. If you were, you wouldn't do this garbage. You're interested in your traditions, your things, your habits, your culture, your fill in the blank, and you do many such things. Jesus' complaint is intense. You buffoons, come here and complain that my followers don't do a ceremonial hand washing before they eat. You're destroying my church. It is, it is it's a fierce counterattack of how dare you come with this piddly little thing when you're wrecking the reputation of my father's house. Your attitudes about what is important and your pride and your greed and your hatefulness make a mockery of what God has actually told you to live like. You are not living biblically, you are living traditionally, and that is an unacceptable error. So let's bring this back to the 21st century. First, I want to speak to anyone who might be in this room right now that has been hurt by the church before, and you're trying to figure this out. Maybe you're, you're in this room and you're giving us a shot, but the, the truth is, in the past, you've been hurt by the church. Here's what I want to say to you. Jesus was seriously frustrated by the church of his time. He was. Jesus was sometimes angry at the church of his time. Jesus criticized the church of his time. And here's what I'm going to say. The church has not always done the right thing. I'm an ordained minister who has some small wedge of authority. Whatever that authority that I've been granted, I will use it right now just to say this. On behalf of churches everywhere, we've done some stupid stuff that have hurt people, and it was wrong. But I'm not challenging you, you to embrace church. I'm challenging you to embrace Jesus. Maybe it would take years for you to figure out how to forgive something that's happened to you or someone you know. In fact, I get it. But you don't have to forgive the church to embrace Jesus. You can embrace Jesus, he'll fix your forgiveness issue. We, we don't ask people to get fixed first. Embrace Jesus the way you are. You're mad at the church, it's okay. You can embrace Jesus mad at the church. You can do that. And you know what? Jesus is worth of your, worthy of your embrace. Jesus' character will not let you down. Jesus did not condone some of the things that have happened. It's not his fault. Jesus is the ultimate example of good. He is the one who lives right now and wants you to know him. Jesus cares about how you have been treated, and he knows how to heal you. And he really is the only one who can. If you've been hurt by anything, whether it's the church, or your family, or culture, or your friends, or whatever it is you've been hurt by, I'm telling you, there's only one person who can really heal you the way you need to be healed. That's Jesus. That's why you need to embrace him. He is the only answer that can really fix what's destroying you on the inside. Whatever that source is, even if the source is the church itself, he's the only one that can fix it. So don't reject Jesus because you've sometimes been angry with the church. Don't do it. If you want to know more about how you can meet Jesus, please come talk to me here or at my home or anywhere at all. If you're a member of our congregation or a regular attender or uh, someone who says, I'm absolutely committed to my relationship with Christ, then here's, here's the challenge. How's our biblical world you doing? Are we doing better than 6%? Oh, I sure hope so. I sure hope that, that Australia's church community 
is more solidly based on what the Bible actually says than we're managing in my country. I hope so. Our action is based on what this book actually says. Our action is based on what the church expectations are. Look, love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. And if everything we do doesn't fit somewhere into one of those two categories, we're doing it wrong. That's what Jesus said. And so if we've managed to make something religious that we think we have to do, but it doesn't actually mean that I'm loving God, and it doesn't actually mean that I'm loving my neighbor, I've messed it up. I've made a tradition or a habit or a thing that's religious, and it isn't actually meeting the criteria. It's broke. It's broke. If there's anything we're doing as a church that we can't easily see it's about loving God with my whole heart and mind and soul and strength or it's really about loving my neighbor as myself. If we can't clearly see the connection, we're doing it wrong. Yeah. So we've got to think critically about the habits we have, the programs we do, the ways that we deal with things, what we think church is about, what it is we do here, and we've got to make sure that it fits those two targets Perfect. See, we have a chance for Exmouth to have a different opinion of us than Americans have of the church in America, right? Yeah. That's, this is our shot. This is our chance. This is who we are. This is what we get to do. And in America, people between the ages of 16 and 29 that are outside the church want nothing to do with it. So it's our job to see if we can do better. Here. And I'm suggesting the way to do better is to, to quit thinking so much about what traditionally we're supposed to be and start talking, thinking biblically about who we're supposed to be and how we treat people. Yeah. That's how we change how people actually see us. So does Exmouth know us by our sense of judgment or by the message of grace and forgiveness? Does Exmouth know us by who we love or by who we hate? I don't know, what do they know us by? Do they see us as old-fashioned, or do they see us as people who have answers for today? Do they know us by our political speeches, or do they know us by the biblical wisdom that we bring with us? Truth that's relevant to them. Does Exmouth see us as people out of touch, or do they see us reaching out in compassion to everyone that we meet? Do they see us as insensitive, or do they know that we grieve when they grieve, we rejoice when they rejoice, that, that we're connected with them, that, that no matter who you are, whether you're Christian or not Christian, if you've had a death in your family, we're re we've been right there with you. And if you've had a success and you want a prize, we're celebrating and jumping up and down with you. We're in touch with you. We get it. We're, we're still people who like you. We aren't, it is not that, oh, yeah, we would care if you were in our tribe. But you're not in our tribe, so do your thing. We can't allow that kind of thing to be what we're known by. Here's what we never, ever, ever, ever want to be. We never want to be the guys in this story that Jesus is slamming. We don't want to be these people. We don't want to be the people who put churchy religious things above real people. And living the standards that God actually put forward as one of the baselines for what it means to please Him. We don't ever want to be those people. As a final word, let me just reaffirm something that I think is so important. And these are just some standards I think we need to, to think about as a church, as leaders, as people, as what everything we do. Here's, here's three takeaways. Here's one. These are practical. Taking care of your family comes before meeting your church obligations. Amen. Okay? Let's just make it clear. If I, I'll make it so easy. On Sunday morning, you're scheduled on roster. You're supposed to help out, and you feel like everyone's depending on you. If your family has a nuclear meltdown, I've had them. This is not judging time. And you need to take care of your family. Would you call me and we will figure out roster for you. Take care of your family. Don't ever feel like somehow the pressure or the responsibility or that you'll be looked down on because you didn't do something in church because you were taking care of the wife and the kids at home doing what you were supposed to do. You do that. 
Don't ever get confused about that. Mm -hmm. Number two. Well, now, um, as a church, we, we have bills, and we do appreciate your financial gifts, but if you come in contact with a real need in our community and God tells you to meet that need financially, would you please do it? Would you please honor God by doing what God has asked you to do? God will either replace it and you'll still be able to give the tithe or whatever it is you plan, or he won't. But I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about this. Don't let any person feel like, oh, I could have been helped by this person, but no, they were saving it to give to the church. No. Help people that need to be helped. I, whatever risk that incurs, I'm willing to take it. Would you please be obedient to the Holy Spirit in the moment? And if he says to do something, do it. Our church must never become an excuse for why you didn't do the right thing with your money. Or the right thing about anything. Our church can't be an excuse for that. Number three, if you're on the way to Bible study and a person is on the side of the road and they need help, it is more godly to love them than, than to talk about loving them. It's more godly to help them than to study about helping people. Yeah. <laughs> do the thing that we need to do to love the people in our town, in our community, visitors that come, whatever it is, to do Stop your life and realize that is more important than whatever it is we're doing in this building. Love people all the time. Because coming here and studying about doing it is we're useless if we're not doing it. That's right. We make up a church, and that church is not about worshiping God in every aspect of our life and loving people in an undeniable way, then we are wasting our time. Our actual choices, what we do every day, will prove, without a doubt, whether we are a group of people who enjoy religious traditions on Sunday mornings, or if we are a family dedicated to loving our Father and each other, and Exmouth will know which one we are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We have an opportunity. God, our church will earn a reputation, guaranteed. It, it can't help but have one. We, we will have one. It isn't a question of whether we will have a reputation. The question is what kind of reputation will we have? And Lord, would you protect us from chasing a reputation? Mm -hmm. Well, that isn't the goal of the word either. And yet, Lord, I, I am absolutely convinced that if our goal was to, to love you and please you, and that if our goal was to genuinely love our neighbor, we would have the reputation we're supposed to have. That would sort itself out. That our relevancy and our the way that the x views us, it would be correct if we get this correct. Lord, protect us from... The attitude of, I come on Sunday morning because I enjoy the, the activities on Sunday mornings. Because, Lord, that is not actually church. Would you bring us into a place where we are a team who comes together to encourage one another, to strengthen one another, that we would be active and powerful in our community, and that in our lives, every day, we would honor you and love you, and we would love each other powerfully. We thank you that your word is not out of sync with Christ. Lord, would you make us people who are actually biblical instead of people who are just traditional? Mm. Would you help us to see the tie <coughs> between those things? Would you help our church to have the kind of reputation that Jesus has in the world around us? Because that would be good enough for me, God. That would be way good enough for me is if every person who looked at our church thought the same things that the world in general thinks about Jesus Christ, 
that'd be okay. But we will only do that when we start emulating Jesus Christ and who he is, what he actually did, what his attitudes actually were. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the beautiful body of Christ. And thank you for the people in this room that can, we can celebrate with and know, even if it's just for today, that we would love them and encourage each other, that we would be strengthened by each other's presence, that we would be able to pray for each other before we leave, that this would be a place where each person was able to contribute what they uniquely have been given by God to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.